Hello everyone, I am Karthi. I'm from Singapore and this is Karthi Reviews where I review everything in and out of this earth. This is my new channel that I've created for reviewing South Asian movies and music with an environmental perspective. Last year, I was the co-producer of a Tamil podcast series called Soli Laranga or Beyond Words, which was commissioned by the National Arts Council Singapore. In this 10-part podcast series, we surveyed the Singapore Tamil literature landscape and spoke to writers, storytellers, youth and other literary creatives. This series is still available on all major streaming platforms like Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube, where you can listen to it with English subtitles. So check it out when you can. It was also during the production of this podcast series that I realized that there is a lack of meaningful content that really dissects our South Asian films and music from multiple perspectives. Yes, there are excellent film critics and film reviewers from South Asia. I, for one, love Bharatwa Churangan and Anupama Chopra's film companion website and podcast series where they review South Asian works with a very intellectual slant. However, they interrogate more about the filmmaking, the technical aspects of the film like the colour, the texture, the music, the camera angles, the storytelling, but they do not elaborate on how this artistry helps to bring about awareness or action for socio-economic or environmental issues. Environmental issues or environmental justice are especially very underplayed among South Asian media critics compared to other social justice issues like LGBTQ, women or even caste issues. There are several independent magazines, websites like Brown Girl Mag, Project Uyir Publication and a very recent Diaspora Tamil podcast series called Two Suitcases that talk about feminism, LGBTQ portrayal in films. But critics or writers do not really dig deep into the environmental perspectives present in the South Asian films or music that they consume. Even the viral song that I'm going to be talking about today is very explicitly about environmental injustice, yet this is rarely touched upon by mainstream media coverage. Hence, in this podcast series, I'll be taking on an environmental perspective to analyze South Asian media to hopefully show that any environmental issue is inextricably linked with social justice issues rather than being a totally isolated issue. It's not like, you know... The, and this is environment, so it's totally separate from other social issues, we have to realize that the environment is always synergistically interacting with various social issues and identities. For the sake of making our discussion more substantive and meaningful, I'll be tapping into some theories and ideas from the field of environmental humanities, but never fear, because the whole point is to dip our toes into these issues in a simple and relatable, but in a meaningful way. I know it can get a bit nerdy and academic, but stay woke, friends. This series is dedicated mostly to the global South Asian diaspora communities, especially the youth. When we started releasing the Tamil Literary Podcast series, we realized that majority of our listenership are outside of Singapore, mostly from Canada, Australia, Hong Kong, US, Malaysia, and of course, India, even though the podcast series itself was on Singapore Tamil literature. This is actually a trend that I see where I see a lot of South Asian diaspora youth are passionate about supporting fresh and sensible content no matter where they are being made. So I thank you for that and I I hope you would continue to support me. So, on the first episode of this new series, I would like to speak about a Tamil song called Enjoy Enjami that is going extremely viral right now in the digital space. <laughs> Released in March this year, Enjoy Enjami is the latest Tamil blockbuster song that has garnered more than 150 million views on YouTube and over 2 million hits on Spotify. Packed with catchy tunes and evocative visuals, this song is one of the first Tamil pop songs that sheds light on environmental issues. This song has especially kicked up quite a storm among global Tamil listeners because it breaks away from the mold of Tamil pop music that largely serves to accentuate romantic moments in films. 
I grew up listening to Tamil songs where they were always very filmy and romantic, where the guy will propose to the girl and then the girl will be like, yes! And then they will just, you know, bam, the scene cuts to them dancing in Switzerland for a duet. And I'm like, bro, when did that happen? But this song, Enjoy Enjami, alludes to serious issues like the oppression and injustice upon low-caste, landless Tamil laborers, which we'll be speaking more about later. Now, let's get to know a bit more about the people behind this song. Enjoy Enjami is sung by the and rapper Arive with music by Santosh Narayanan. It is the first song to be produced under the label House of Maja, which is co-owned by my favourite A.R. Rahman, the very famous and extremely talented Grammy and Oscar award-winning Indian composer. He started this label to provide a global platform for independent South Asian artists who would like to put their music in an international space. I am sure anyone who is into Tamil music would be familiar with most of the artists associated with this song like A.R. Rahman, Santosh Narayanan and D. But who is this rapper Arive who belts out very eccentric moves in the music video of Enjoy Enjami if you have watched and sings in a very croaky old person's voice? <laughs> Well, rapper Arive is actually imitating his grandmother in this portion of the song. He is part of Castless Collective, an indie band from Chennai, India, that aims to bring together local musicians from marginalized communities and produce music that is reflective of their lived experiences. In an interview with the channel Vice Asia, Arive and his bandmates share how just because they were from the lower caste, the art forms specific to their caste are relegated to being merely funeral music. One of their band members even shared how a person from the upper caste insulted them by calling them funeral musicians when they asked this person if they could perform during the Margali season. So for those who do not know, the Margali season is this music season in Chennai, India, where where it's predominantly dominated by Indian classical music rather than folk genres. And this man actually said to Arivu and his friends that he had to take a shower for talking to people like them, saying that, you know, implying that they are polluting. If you say that I'm coming from a village, they will ask you in which street you live. It's asking which caste you belong to. That's not equality. I'm a human just like you and I want to be free as well. So, what Castless Collective, this band, does is that it makes music that blends folk music forms like Ghana with hip-hop and rap to lend a voice to the inequalities faced by the lower caste people and artists, at the same time resist against the hegemonic influence of Indian classical music in the Indian music space. But in Enjoy Enjami, while he talks about caste issues, he also talks about the environmental injustice faced by lower caste landless Tamil laborers. In many of his interviews, he has said that the lyrics are partially a tribute to his grandmother, Vali Amal, who was brought by the British to work as laborers in tea plantations of Sri Lanka, which is why there's a line in the song, Vali Amal Perandi Sangadiye Kurandi which means Baliyama's grandson is here to tell you something. Even the word Enjami in the song's title Enjoy Enjami means my dear, which is an endearing term in which Arive's grandma used to call Arive. Many laborers like Valiyamal faced a lot of oppression and exploitation in the plantation. In a 1995 paper by migration scholar Ganapati Pillai, he outlines the lives of the Tamil laborers in the British-owned tea estates, where they were literally held captive. These people, they are called indenture laborers, and they were brought from India to wherever, some, some countries even in Africa, Southeast Asia, and Sri Lanka, where they were brought together as families and they were made to work in the plantations as families with all aspects of their lives controlled. Following independence from the British, the citizenship laws by the Sinhalese government disqualified Indian Tamil plantation workers from attaining citizenship. They were deemed stateless and repatriated back to India in a series of repatriation agreements between India and Sri Lanka. Even after returning to India, these laborers had to wait in refugee camps with poor living conditions before they could be granted Indian citizenship. 
Moreover, they faced discrimination in India as low caste members and did not have any land of their own and had to continue being exploited as laborers working under other high caste landowners. This ties in with the issue of land reformation of India post-independence, where the zamindar or feudal system of land ownership was abolished and land was redistributed to lower caste landless farmers and laborers. However, Hugo Goringe, a British academic studying Dalit activism in India, actually claims that currently this land allocation only exists on paper and does not exist in practice as higher caste landowners with power and political backing continue to grab and usurp the land of the lower caste. This is such a dire situation because the lower caste people, they are from the same village, they share the same space with this upper caste people, but they are being ostracized, their land are being snatched by the upper caste, leaving them without any livelihood. They are unable to do their agriculture, they are unable to have a sense of belonging to the place, and more importantly, they are not able to have proper nourishment. And this becomes more pronounced with climate change, where the landless laborers who are at the bottom of the pecking order tend to suffer the most from all these erratic weather patterns and the lack of agricultural yield. Because if there's a lack of agricultural yield, the upper caste landowners, they will try to absorb as much of the profit as they can and only give very little wages to the people at the bottom of the pecking order, which is the lower caste. And this is an issue that is not talked about so much. You know, we talk about caste oppression, but they do not see the links between the environmental problems, climate change, and how it intersects with caste, causing a lot of injustice to marginalized groups of people. So then this lower caste Dalits move from the rural villages to urban centers, at least with the hope of earning a livelihood. However, there they are also ostracized and are usually those who work as funeral singers, grave diggers and manual scavengers in Tamil Nadu as well as elsewhere in India. Hence, Enjoy and Jami should be viewed as an important piece of political music. Mark Pedalti, the author of the very seminal book Ecomusicology, Rock, Folk and the Environment, which I'll be quoting quite a bit in this series and episode, he distinguishes two ways of looking at music with political meanings. One, he says, is the politics of music, where the music does not have an explicitly political dimension like maybe Dua Lipa's Physical from the hit album Future Nostalgia. I really thought that Physical was basically a song about sex, but listeners, critics, activists, they read into this kind of songs and draw connections to larger structures and ideologies. For example, people link Dua Lipa's Physical and the urgency of the beat to the role of dance music in the 1980s AIDS crisis in New York among gay communities where the idea of being physical was a political position. Meanwhile, another form of music with political meaning is overtly political music where the song is more direct and declarative about its political agenda. It's obvious that Enjoy and Jami falls into the category of political music that is direct in its fight for landless laborers, in its fight for environmental justice. Stay tuned to find out how the song uses its lyrics and its visuals to inspire environmental awareness and action. This is Karthi Reviews, where I review everything in and out of this earth. Welcome back. This is Karthi Reviews, where I review everything in and out of this earth. We were speaking about Enjoy and Jami and how it alludes to a lot of environmental themes. So what are these environmental themes? Firstly, Enjoy and Jami makes a lot of reference to human nature entanglements in its lyrics. For example, there's a line in the song, Nai Nari Pune Kunda in the Yeri Kolam Kuda Sundamari, which means the dog, the fox, the cat, they too own these lakes and ponds. Here, the song tries to dismantle human exceptionalism where everything is viewed in relation to the human experience and nature is subordinate to human. In my college as well, some kids recently just started complaining that the jungle fowl or rooster that lives on our campus is making too much noise and asked the infrastructure management to remove or relocate it. 
The very fact that we see the rooster crowing as a nuisance to be dealt with, instead of it sharing this space with us, being part of nature that we have to also live together with, shows how much we see ourselves as higher beings compared to other beings that share our earth with us. But in Enjoy Enjami, it tries to resist against these notions of human exceptionalism and places the nature in the same plane of existence with humans and encourages listeners to see themselves in relation to a multi-species world. Enjoy Enjami's lyrics also places a lot of emphasis on ancestry, indigeneity, land and place making. There's always a constant reference to our ancestors throughout the song. There is a line in the song which is translated to Our ancestors bequeathed us this land with their blessing that illuminates the intergenerational inheritance of the Tamil land from our ancestors. Similarly, there's another verse in the song which goes like this. So this part of the verse, it loosely translates to the land guarded by my ancestors, the devotee that dances. As the earth rotated, the rooster crowed, its excretions fertilized the forest. Now it's turned into our country, then our home too. Here we can read a web of intergenerational interconnections between the Tamil ancestors their spiritual connection as a devotee to God who they believe would protect their land, and finally, their relationship with non-human lives like the rooster. Unlike us, they didn't want the rooster to be relocated, but they thank the rooster for helping to fertilize the land and allow forests to thrive, which is now then being inherited by us as our country or our home. The visuals that accompany the lyrics in the music video show singer Dee wearing a very serious look as she mimes the lyrics. She then walks towards the camera with a facial expression showing a certain amount of grief and distress. It seems like she's actually implicating the viewer that we have forgotten our connections with land and nature and are holding on to very imaginary boundaries like nation and country. She reminds people that the land we call home now used to be the land preserved for nature, for wildlife, which is now being polluted, deforested, etc. But then, how does the song achieve environmental consciousness, awareness or action by just referring to ancestry and indigeneity when most of South India has lost its indigenous people and memories? Well, I am a Tamil person and I do some of the rituals that have indigenous roots like Pongal, the Harvest Festival, but I do not have total relationships with my indigenous past. There has been a lot of intercultural mixing, breeding, migration. So how does the song make use of indigeneity to move people to honour the place that they have inherited? At this point, I would like to bring to attention a book that I read recently about indigeneity called Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge and the Teaching of Plants by Robin Wall Kimara, an environmental studies professor at the State University of New York. In this book, Kimura talks about the understanding of nature, environment and plants through an indigenous Native American perspective and also sharing her own experience of getting in touch with her own indigenous culture. It's a very beautiful book and I really recommend all of you to read it. So at one point in this book, she says that by honouring the knowledge in the land and caring for its keepers, we start to become indigenous to place. In other words, indigeneity is not about hailing from the same lineage of the earliest inhabitants of the land, but being aware of these ancestral linkages, appreciating these linkages, memories and knowledge, and caring for the people who are taking care of this land right now, like farmers, land laborers and plantation workers. In fact, this is what Enjoy Enjami is asking its listeners to do. It is requesting its listeners to acknowledge that the environmental past is fraught with tensions. 
there's been a lot of oppression, exploitation of landless laborers. But at the same time, we have to appreciate the knowledge, the culture and the gifts that is at least remaining right now that has not been lost. Which is why the title of the song is Enjoy Enjami, where it invites us to naturalize our place in the land by enjoying or living as if this is the land that feeds you, as if these are the streams and lakes from which we drink that nourishes us, our bodies and spirit. This is also why there's an echoing portion in the song where singer D sings, My tree, my land, my forest, my people, my clan, my place, my track, reminding herself that this is what she has inherited and this is what she should honour and appreciate. There's also a sense of collectivity about naturalizing ourselves to the land and enjoying it. The chorus of the song repeats, Enjoy enjami, vango vango onagi, ammai ambari, inda inda mumari, which means, enjoy my dear, come together as one, ride on the elephants, shower in the rains. The picturization of the song also shows close-up shots of people, especially the poor labourers, the low-caste musicians, celebrating the nature, their culture and their lives by dancing happily in a campfire. Enjoy Njami's music video thus creates a form of utopia which drives the desire for the listener or the viewer to want to live a different or better way of being. In this case, a life that appreciates nature, a life that celebrates and embraces the marginalized people and their culture. Literary and film scholar Alexa Wake von Mosner calls this a form of concrete utopia, where there is truly an emotion of hope that something would be socially possible, that people from all social strata can come together and celebrate and protect nature. This is in contrast to other forms of very abstract utopia, like when we watch a movie like Avatar, where we want to live in Pandora. People had this Pandora syndrome. Uh, where they wanted to live with the Navi people. It's very escapist, where we compensate our current lives in the Anthropocene with dreaming about leading a very regressive life with nature. But Enjoy and Jami, on the other hand, offers a concrete utopia where it is a form of social dreaming, but it is also within our reach. We can somewhat anticipate that one day there may be a casteless society, given the kind of movements that we're witnessing today, like the casteless collective band I was talking about, or even this song. So we have spoken a lot about human nature entanglements, indigeneity, and the happy coexistence of humans, nature, and cultures that were present in the song. But in the final section, we are going to change gears a bit and enter a darker theme about how musically the song speaks to the grief of the landless laborers. So stay tuned and do not exit this episode. This is Carthy Reviews, where I review everything in and out of this earth. Welcome back! This is Karthi Reviews, where I review everything in and out of this earth. We have been talking about how the song uses its lyrics and visuals to create a form of environmental consciousness that allows a spiritual attachment to the land and nature that we have inherited. Now, let's delve a bit into how this song sounds musically. I would say Enjoy Enjami defies the Western conventions of how pop music sounds when conveying environmental themes. Mark Padalti, the eco-musicology scholar that I mentioned earlier, writes that to signal environmental themes, pop musicians tend to use more subdued rhythms than usual, create simple timbral textures, incorporate acoustic instrumentation, and either bring lead vocals up front or drop backup harmonies altogether to allow the lyrics to be more clearly understood, producing a relatively spare folk vocal sound. This reminds me of Peter Oren's 2017 album Anthropocene, which was primarily a folk-sounding album with very simple textures, very acoustic-sounding, there wasn't much background harmonies, etc. But at the same time, it created this reflective mood where listeners join Peter Oren and navigate their lives in the climate change world together with him, whether it's about like you know fighting against the establishment or whether it's just sitting at your house, just reflecting about the climate climate crisis and having so much of guilt or sadness. But in contrast, what we have here in Enjoy Enjami is very different. 
It is a crazy mix of upbeat music, very reminiscent of the Afro beat, and accompanying strong vocals by D. D, she has this very strong, distinctive alto voice that is the backbone of the song. But as much as the song sounds very upbeat and joyous, talking about happy coexistence, coming together to enjoy nature as seen in the lyrics, the sound of the song also takes a sharp, poignant turn when rapper Arivu's voice transforms into a raspy cry. What you just heard is an Indian folk style of singing called Opari. So this portion of the song was sung by Arivu, like I mentioned earlier, who imitated how his grandma might sound. So Opari is a dirge sung together by lower caste women in groups during funerals that has been infused into this song Enjoy Enjami. The English translations of what you just heard is a woman crying and saying, I planted five trees, created a beautiful garden. Even though my garden has flourished, my throat remains dry. Similarly, another Opari portion in the song loosely translates into Bitter God in my canopy, it has given us seeds, given us seeds left by our mom and dad. The bitter God here can be read as the bitter histories of oppression experienced by earlier generations that has sown seeds and has continued to strike roots in current generations. I think that is the strength of this song. It starts off being very cheeky with contemporary tunes and the repeated cuckoo, cuckoo, adding to the playful element of the song. And then it suddenly hits us hard with this musical twist where we learn of the plight of landless labourers through the opari. Especially there is a sharp contrast created in the verses where we see the woman toiling so hard for the crops to flourish, but her throat remains dry. The crops flourish, but she wasn't flourished. She wasn't nourished. Josh Wardak, an environmental humanities scholar, argues that popular music that touches on environmental themes is able to engage listeners more emotionally than intellectually, encouraging them to take action. He cites examples of popular music like the music videos of Bjork, Radiohead, Julian Lennon's Saltwater, and of course Michael Jackson's Earth Song. However, we have to distinguish Enjoy and Jami from these songs due to the technique it has used to convey emotions about environmental injustice. Yes, the song has employed a lot of contemporary tunes and the music video looks like one of Beyonce's dance hits, but there's this debut of the Tamil folk genre, Opari, into this world music space that must not be overlooked and has to be discussed in detail. How does this fusion of the folk genre opari in a popular music convey emotions that are very effective in calling for action? What you just heard is a real Opari session that occurred in a rural area of Tamil Nadu where women come together in funerals and lament a wide range of problems and even injustices that happens in their home. So even if they attend someone else's funeral, they will definitely cry for that person. And then after that, their wailing and weeping will be about their own lives, like, oh my god, my husband doesn't give us enough money to run the house. And their laments usually happens in very open air structures so that it can be heard by everyone. And possibly, you know, if if some of the women who is like, you know, singing and saying that she is abused, you know, other men who are surrounded by these women, they will be able to take action. Musically as well, Opari is not just an emotional upheaval where you're like, ah, kind of thing, but it is a very structured musical composition of compressions and climatic moments. Paul D. Green, an American ethnomusicologist who studied Opari, claims that as women lament, it is gradually elaborated into controlled pattern melodic phrases with increasing consistency and redundancy, and then reaches a crescendo and becomes a wept song, which we can also see in the song Enjoy Enjami. 
Performatively as well, Green notices that women use their hands to hit their breasts and the collarbone area. They also lean against each other and hug each other, swaying as they perform the opari. So this performance is like showing grief, pain and solidarity at the same time. Successful opari performances by women like this can also function as vehicles of social protest and special appeals for sympathy. For instance, Selvi Tirchandran, a Sri Lankan anthropologist in her book Feminine Speech Transmissions, provides a case study of Sri Lankan Tamil women who had lost their sons and husbands in the Tamil Sinhalis conflict coming together in front of a court to sing dirges as a protest against the Sinhalis soldiers who were being questioned for the war crimes inside the court. Even though the protest wasn't successful in punishing the war criminals, it gained quite a lot of traction in the international community and people started to acknowledge the Tamil Sinhalese conflict as a genocide of the Tamils. So we can read this debut of Opari in a Tamil pop music like Enjoy Enjoy Me in a similar way, where it is the voice of the marginalized landless laborers, lower caste people, the domestic coming out into the international digital space and publicizing their grievances for their lost land through the song that they know best. Another important element of Opari is the idea of mourning and grieving. I recently read a book called Flight Ways by Tom Van Dorian that talks about birds mourning for the loss of their kind. He says that the mourning helps these birds to reorientate themselves in this world, transforming them to accommodate a changed reality. Oh my god, what does this mean? So, for example, when a magpie sees their fellow magpie has died from a crash, a car crash. So as they mourn in front of the dead magpie, you know, they, they cry, they, they make this crow, croaky sound, they become reoriented to not fly across the road or use the road, for example. They learn that this is a dangerous predator, something to avoid in the future. Similarly, when us as humans, we mourn or grieve with extinct animals which have already become dead, we allow ourselves to orientate into new ways of living. It offers us a way into an alternative space, one where we acknowledge and respect the dead, where we become more considerate for the biodiversity that we are losing. Similarly, as we listen to the opari and the morning and enjoy and jami, the listeners are also invited into this collective performance of grieving for lost nature, displaced identities and oppression, which will hopefully reorientate us to new ways of living, where we will work together to fight against environmental injustice towards the lower caste people. I hope I've not rambled too much, but this is a topic really close to my heart. I come from quite a privileged caste, and I know this because my parents continued to import their caste-conscious beliefs from India to Singapore, just like many other diaspora Indians around the world. And I'm always against these gross discrimination and stereotypes that they have. Like my mom is able to guess what a caste a person is just by small talking with them about where the person's hometown is, which particular gods they pray to in Hinduism, or, you know, by guessing their slang or accent. But I think it's not about this game of whose caste is bigger or better than mine, but realizing that because of this competition, there is a whole stratum of the society being marginalized and oppressed through this deep hierarchy that we have created. And much of the caste oppression are very much related to land and the environment, which is often overlooked. We often talk about racism, classism, even disability in relation to climate justice, but seldom talk about caste oppression and climate justice. Hence, I feel that more of such conversations on caste oppression in relation to climate and environmental justice should be brought to the forefront, especially in South Asian Indian communities. And I'm happy that this episode has kick-started this conversation. Next episode, I'll be talking about a chilling film where a Dalit family does everything they can to fend off men from the upper caste who are willing to even kill them to usurp their land. Stay tuned, this is Karthi Reviews, where I review anything and everything in and out of this earth. 